Hey guys, how's everybody doing today? Sorry, a little bit of technical difficulty there this morning. Um, we hope this is working. And, uh oh. There we go. So, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Becky, and I am the with the education team at Teton Raptor Center. So, really excited to talk to you guys this morning about owls, and we are here to geek out with our beak out. So, we are going to not play around. We're going to get started and go ahead and introduce you to our first bird. Um, the first bird, sorry, technology today. We are going to meet our first ferocious beast of a bird. This is Train. Look at everyone, Train, can't you see? Come on, Train. Oh, Train is more worried about me because I'm the closest predator right now. But anyway, we thank you so much for tuning in and we are gonna spend a little time this morning learning about owls. So first things first, we need to know before we know anything else about owls, why owls are so important. Owls are so crucial to have in the environment and that's for a couple of reasons. One, owls balance the ecosystem. So exactly, Train. So owls actually, they feed on small rodents and insects. They feed on a lot of things that can help us out and they keep the environment balanced. Without these guys, mice and squirrels would just be running amok, amok, amok. So that's no good at all. So owls are doing us a service. Owls are also really important because they clean the environment. These guys are birds, not mammals. So they actually, uh, they don't carry the same diseases. It doesn't mean they don't carry any diseases, but they don't carry the same diseases. And so we really need to appreciate them because for example, they can't catch or transmit rabies, uh, which is pretty amazing. And so that protects when, when people think, oh, those owls, I'm worried about them getting my dog or my cat out of my yard. Could that happen? Possibly, but way more likely we should be grateful for what owls are doing for us because they're protecting our pets. So let's focus for a minute. These are my pets. We're going old school with the visuals today, by the way. So these are my pets. Aren't they adorable? Aren't they? Aren't they? Becky, focus. Oh, fine. Okay. I just thought I'd throw them in there. So owls actually protect our pets by eating uh, sick animals that might otherwise transmit their diseases onto the, onto the pets. So they're actually keeping your yard clean, which is another really cool thing. And then finally, owls tell us about the environment. Because they're at the top of the food chain, owls are actually really, really helpful. So if owls were to disappear from an area, that's very telling. It's telling us that something is going on in the environment. Um, so this owl, Terrain is her name. She is an Eastern screech owl. So Eastern screech owls come in two different colors. They come in red, like Train here, and they come in gray. And this is full size, full size, guys. So uh, it turns out that owls are like dogs. They come in all different sizes. They come in small and they come in large. Uh, here's some examples for you. Look at that good looking person. Wow. There I am with a burrowing owl several years ago. Uh, that's how tiny some, and they're, and burrowing owls aren't even the smallest owl. There is an owl called an elf owl that weighs like half of what this kid weighs. So burrowing owls are really cool. And then they get all the way up to this beast of a bird. That is our resident Eurasian eagle owl. Her name is K2 and uh, they're among the heaviest owls on earth. So that said, owls range, this one weighs in at about the weight of a baseball. And it turns out owls are all fluff. They're all feathers. And so uh, it's pretty cool to imagine the heaviest on earth, even that Eurasian eagle owl, who by the way, can take down, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Small deer. They can take down a deer over in Europe called a roe deer that's about the size of our key deer. So, and that bird, that monster owl that can take down a 50 pound deer weighs less than a gallon of milk. Most of them weigh in at between six and seven pounds. A gallon of milk weighs about eight and a half. Amazing, amazing how these guys are so incredibly diverse. So remember, Owls are like dogs. They come in chihuahua size and they come in great Dane and Mastiff size. And because of that, they feed on everything too. Some of them feed on little insects and some of them might go all the way up and feed on large, large mammals too, which is really incredible stuff. So what makes a bird an owl? 
Uh, as we look at Train, there are a couple of really cool traits about her that tell me that she is an owl and not some other kind of bird. So first trait that's really cool about owls, they are exactly as soft as they appear to be. Owls are really, really soft. And that's because their feathers have little fringes right on the edges of them. And that allows them to fly silently. It allows them to cut the air. So they're not really known for speed like a falcon. These guys are known for being super, super stealthy. That's what they do. So they have these really cool fringes on their feathers. So I have a wing here of an owl. Don't panic. Don't panic. This owl was never alive at Teton Raptor Center. Teton Raptor Center has what's called a, um, a salvage permit, and that allows us to take animals that have died in the wild, most of them naturally. It allows us to take that, and then um, we're able to use their parts. So even in death, um, a bird can... Uh, a bird can still have a purpose and a bird can still teach. So the cool thing about owls, oh, can you guys not hear? Let's see. Let's see. We're going to figure out why you can't hear me. We can hear. Some can hear, some can't. Yes, we can hear. Okay. Thanks for those saying they're hearing. So those who can't hear, maybe try some of your own settings. Hopefully um, it's a setting on your end. A lot of folks say they're able to hear. So I'm going to try and keep going. I'm sorry in advance to those who can't hear. Maybe it'll come through later for you. Um, anyway, so owls have these super cool fringes on the edge of their wing. So right along the top edge of their wing, it looks like a comb. And so if we zoom in on that more old school technology, you can see that the top of their feathers look like a comb and that cuts the air. And that's one really cool trait about owls. Owls have that to help them fly silently. Another really cool trait about owls is that they have feathery toes. Owls are feathered all the way down to their feet. Uh, this is a really cool close up of one of our owls uh, feet. That's K2 again, our resident Eurasian eagle owl. And I have a couple of owl feet here for you to see as well. This is the foot of a great horned owl. Again, same thing. This was a bird that was never alive at the Raptor Center. It was part of our salvage permit. But look how cool those super fuzzy toes are. Owls need those fuzzy feet for a couple of reasons. One, they don't migrate very far. Some owls do. There's always exceptions to the rules, but a lot of owls will actually hang out in very uh, close area year round. They kind of locally migrate, maybe from higher elevation to lower elevation, something like that. Um, but they need those fuzzy feet. It helps keep them warm. It also helps protect them a little bit. So when they're hunting with those really cool talons, it'll help them hunt a little bit, protect them against prey that wants to fight back. And then the other cool thing about the fuzzy feet it also goes back into silent flight. It helps them fly silently. So owls have some pretty cool adaptations. They've got uh, fringes on the feathers. They've got feathered feet. And of course, one of the coolest things about owls, boom, 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 the facial disc. Owls have this super cool round face and the feathers on their face allow them to listen. So we always think about owls nocturnal, owls nocturnal, owls nocturnal. And it is true that owls have nocturnal tendencies. It's true that they tend to talk a lot at night, that they tend to be awake at night. Um, but they also take advantage of daylight. And I have never met an owl that at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, if the food shows up and they see a mouse run by, they look at their watch and say, I wish it was dark so I could eat that food. It just doesn't work that way. These guys are capable of being out in the daytime, but what's even cooler is that they are built for being out in very low light at night because that's when a lot of their food is out as well. Um, so owls have that really cool facial disc. And if you think about it, the shape of that facial disc is the same shape as your ear. So when I look at this, I've got these little half circles on the sides of my face and a facial disc. It's two half circles, just like an ear. And so that's funneling sounds, which leads us to the question, where are their ears? Where are your ears, Train? Turns out these things on top, look at the humans, dude. You can do it. No, not happening. These tufts on top of our head, 
those are not her ears. Those are just feathers. They help her look bigger and they help her, um, they can help her communicate like a dog a little bit and they can help her camouflage. But her ears, if you can find your own ears, can everyone do that? I know a lot of the adults are not trying right now, but they probably need the practice. If you can find your own ears, then you can find an owl's ears. Their ears are positioned right on the sides of their head, right on the edge of that facial disc. So their facial disc is acting like a satellite dish, it's funneling the sounds down into their ears. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass off train here to my lovely assistant, thank you, Amanda. Just kidding, she's part of the education team too. And then I'm gonna grab our next bird that we're gonna meet this morning, okay? So the next bird, um, that I want you to meet today. This is how the birds came to us uh, back in September of 2015. So this is the next bird we're gonna meet and I'm here to tell ya, uh, it was not a pretty sight. This bird came to us, September is a really weird time of year for a baby bird to hatch in this area. Teton Raptor Center, for those who don't know, we're in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And so in September, it can start to snow here. So having baby birds, that's not really cool to have around. Um, so anyway, she hatched really late and this bird showed up at the Raptor Center from Idaho Fish and Game Department, who we were super grateful for. They got a call about this, this really sick baby bird. She was so sick, people didn't even know what she was. And it took me a little while to figure it out myself. Um, and so she came to us looking really bad. She was starving. She had a broken jaw. She required, this is kind of crazy, 67 shots her first three days at Teton Raptor Center. She had to have 67 shots. So she was in bad shape, but the good news is she did well. And just a few days later, this is what she was starting to look like. So needless to say, uh, we were very, very pleased and excited that she started to do better. And I'm even more excited now that she's four and a half years old, let's meet her. Today, she has made a huge recovery and she's doing really, really well. And she would like to say good morning to everyone. Say hi, Zana. So this is Manzana. She is our resident barn owl. Now Manzana here, barn owls, uh, they are super cool birds. Barn owls are actually, um, they're found on every single continent except Antarctica. So there was a time when they were the most widely distributed land bird on planet Earth. Um, these guys are super fun and we're going to talk about our head tilt here in a minute. So when Manzana got bigger and stronger, and I should mention that these guys grow really fast. So a bird hatches out of its egg and within a few days, they're as big as they're going to be. And then they grow their feathers. So Zana here by November, she came to us in September and by November, she was looking really good. And we were starting to think about releasing her back into the wild. I should mention that Teton Raptor Center has three pillars in our work. So we don't just have these education birds. We actually do three things at the Raptor Center. The first thing we do is research. So we're out in the wild, studying the wild birds, trying to understand their movements, especially things like migration. What are they feeding on? Where are they hanging out? We put a lot of transmitters on birds for places like the US Park Service um, and the Forest Service to help understand the movements of these birds through the woods. Then if a bird becomes ill or injured, we take them in, fix them up and get them out. So we're also a bird hospital. And then in the event they can't be released, they get placed in an education program. So Zana and Train fall into that category. I should mention Train is a bird from Alabama and she hatched um, a couple of years ago. She was the victim of a collision found along the train tracks. So we think she might've been clipped by a train. Um, in Manzana's case, you know, she came to us as this baby. We nursed her back to health. Everything was great. And I should mention, we did everything right. We wore camouflage. We didn't try to coddle her, talk to her, treat her like a pet. Uh, we did everything right so that she would not associate humans with food. The problem is for a bird to go back into the wild from the Raptor Center, they, oh, we have to stretch. Can everyone see her getting a little stretch in this morning? Oh, bird yoga is so good for the soul. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I hope you feel better. Okay, good. So it turns out this bird had to pass two tests to go back to the wild. The first test that she had to pass to go back to the wild was that she had to show us she could fly. And I'm here to tell you, she's a great flyer. She does an awesome job, beautiful flyer, excellent wings under there. Barn owls are cool. She loves it when we show off her wings. Uh, and by love, I mean hate. Um, so she's a great flyer. But the second test, 
that they have to pass to be able to go back into the wild is they have to show us that they can hunt. So yes, the Raptor Center keeps some live mice on hand and, um, and sometimes we thank those mice for their service and they are used to help the birds demonstrate that they can hunt for themselves. So for Manzana, it took two days to try this test. The first day we went into her enclosure. Oh, so other side, bird yoga on the other side. Thank you, Zana. Oh, I hope that feels better. The first day that we went in, we had a mouse. We kind of snuck it into her door, and then we watched her through the peephole to see what she would do. So as we're watching her through the peephole, she looked. And by the way, I should mention they live in an enclosure that's about the size of a small bedroom, and they can fly around when they're in their enclosure. That's called a muse. So she was in her muse with the rehab clinic in the little bird hospital, and she saw the mouse. She looked at the mouse. She did a lot of this with her head. And then she pulled her foot up and went to sleep. And that is not the way they're supposed to hunt in the wild. She failed miserably. So we all thought, okay, maybe she's just not hungry. No problem. So day two, same thing. We get a mouse, sneak it into her enclosure. We watch her. Now this time, I should mention, Manzana has credit for one kill in her lifetime. We believe that she has actually... She gets credit for killing one mouse in her life. And that was on day two. She saw the mouse, she jumped down to the ground, and then the mouse ran up underneath her and she sat on it like a chicken. Also not the way she's supposed to do her hunting. And we're pretty sure the mouse had a heart attack. The mouse was indeed dead, but the mouse had not been killed by Manzana. The mouse had had a heart attack from being scared by being sat on by an owl. So Manzana, that was unfortunately the only day that she ever killed a mouse. Now that day when that happened, several of us were standing around pondering and we thought, what is the deal? We opened the enclosure, we're looking at her, we're pondering, looking at this bird saying, why will she not hunt? She can fly. She seems to be in great health now. What's the deal? Well, at that moment, a door slammed down the hall. And when that door slammed, she didn't jump. And that's when we came to realize that Manzana is deaf. She can't hear. So turns out barn owls have some of the best hearing on planet Earth. These guys, um, there are some studies that suggest that these guys can actually hear a mouse's heartbeat from several feet away. So these guys have some of the best hearing on planet Earth. Needless to say, if she can't hear, that's not going to go well, right? Really amazing. Now I brought my water because uh, my mouth gets dry and because I'm trying to stay parched, stay hydrated, everyone. Ah. So that's why Zana came to be with us because she's deaf and unable to hear, uh, which is pretty amazing stuff. So Zana, like I said, will be five years old. With a lot of the birds that we're introducing you to today, we're going to refer to them as he or she. So the question then becomes, how do we know if it's a boy or a girl? <coughs> Pardon me. If your answer is embarrassing, it's wrong. So turns out there are three ways to tell if a raptor is a boy or a girl. One is if it lays eggs. That's reasonable. If it lays eggs, it's a... Amanda, would you like to tell us? Female. That's right. If it lays eggs, it's a girl. So that's a good guess. Um, the other way to tell is size. This is my favorite way to tell. And that's because girl owls are almost always bigger than boy owls. Sometimes they can be quite a bit bigger than the boys. <coughs> which is fantastic. So the girls are bigger, they're stronger, they're more powerful, and they're better, but you know, what else? Who's, who's keeping tabs? No problem. Um, in Manzana's case, we actually know, uh, really it's sort of the secret fourth way, we had a pretty good idea that she was a girl when she was a young bird, just because of her coloring. In most raptors and most owls, the boys and the girls are the exact same colors. You can't tell the difference by their color. But in the case of Manzana, you can see she has those really cool spots on her chest, and her face has got a little bit of color on it. If she was a boy, it would have almost no spots. It would be almost completely white on the belly and a much lighter face. So that's one way that we know she's most likely a girl. And then we confirmed that she was a girl 
by sending her DNA to a lab down in Florida and they tested it to confirm. So sometimes you can't just look at these birds and tell if they're a boy or a girl. You have to take some measurements, weigh them, do different things. And sometimes if you really, really don't know, then you have to send their DNA off. Now, why does it matter? Who cares if it's a boy or a girl? Oh, now we have to stretch both wings at once. My goodness. So I didn't bring you any food. I'm sorry to say. So the reason that sometimes it matters to know if our birds are boys or girls is because um, sometimes they want to lay eggs in captivity. We have an owl right now sitting on eggs in captivity. And if they want to lay eggs because they get a lot of nutrition with us and not as much exercise as they certainly would in the wild, they get a fair share, but not as, not as much. We want to make sure that they don't grow an egg that's so big they can't lay it. That egg can actually get stuck, and it's called being egg-bound. So we want to know if our owls are girls or boys, because if they're a girl and they all of a sudden in the springtime start acting a little bit lethargic, a little tired, not wanting to eat, it could mean that they have an egg stuck duck and I can only imagine that's probably not comfortable so uh, so we pay attention especially to our girl birds in the springtime to make sure that they don't try to lay an egg and get really really sick from not being able to so that is Manzana our resident barn owl and um, I'm gonna put her away and I want to tell you real quick a, a cool fact about barn owls some of you guys are at home and you guys are having to do some distance learning, right? You're having to do some learning from home and check things out from home. I want to give you a little bit, there's a couple of math problems that I want to check out that are just absolutely staggering. Uh, so we call those staggering statistics at Teton Raptor Center. Um, when you think about barn owls, I've already mentioned, they clean the environment, they balance the environment, they're an indicator of the health of the environment. They're so helpful to have around, they're so important. But if nothing else, if you're like, whatever, Becky, I still don't care. This will make you care about barn owls. Barn owls, conservatively speaking, one barn owl eats four mice a day. Voles, moles, mice. That's almost their favorite food, voles, moles, or mice. Oh, is that backwards? I can't tell. Conservatively speaking, they go after four of those a day. If you multiply that times 365 days a year, that means that a barn owl is feeding on almost 1,500 mice a year by itself one barn owl. Now multiply that by all the barn owls on the planet and you can see why it's a really good thing to have barn owls around. So when you see barn owls, and I should mention, where do you think a barn owl likes to live? Uh, barns. For those who said barns, great job. Seeing some great leadership. Yes, barn owls like to live in old buildings. They like to live in barns. They like to live out in agriculture areas. If I'm a farmer, this is my best friend. This thing is way more effective than a barn cat at killing mice and voles and keeping them out of your crops, keeping them out of your grains. So these guys are really good to have around. They're also really prone to nest boxes. So a really cool project you could do at home is to do a little quick Google of barn owl nest box, put it up on a shed or up on a barn um, on your property if you have any open space at all, and maybe you'll draw in some barn owls this year or next. And that is doing way more rodent control than you could ever hope to do with any other means. It's super cool stuff. The other thing people notice a lot about Manzana is she has a head tilt. She always is looking around. She's, she rarely keeps her head perfectly straight up and down. And the reason for that is because, um, because she can't hear. We've had her eyes examined. Manzana does have some issues in one eye, but we've had her eyes examined and um, it turns out we're almost completely certain that her head tilt is just the product of her not being able to hear. Owls, just like dogs, have you ever made a sound and the dog is like, Burp! and you know, the dog's moving their ears around for you. Um, I know for me, uh, in my house, oh look, I brought it back. In my house, I have a dog with ears that are bigger than satellite dishes, and she does that a lot when she hears sounds. Owls, because they don't have these kinds of ears, they'll do that with their head. They'll tilt their whole head. So we think because Manzana can't hear, she just kind of is more comfortable with her head in that position. She may be trying to hear instinctively, um, but it's not hurting her in any way. She's a totally healthy girl, other than that she's unable to hunt on her own. Um, the other thing people ask is, uh, how'd she do that? Her head went upside down. Why didn't it fall off? Great question. Uh, if it fell off, that would be hard to recover from. So we're very glad that owls have incredible flexibility in their necks. And that's because 
I love old school technology. Isn't it fun? That's because humans have got seven bones in our neck, seven bones that let us turn our necks left to right. So there's seven, you know, six or seven pivot points in there. These guys have got 14 cervical vertebrae. Owls have got twice the neck that we have so they can turn their necks twice as far. And we'll talk about why they need to do that with the next bird. So the next bird we're going to meet is a bird from right here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And she hatched the first week of May in 2017. So she's getting ready, 18, 19, 20, yes, no, 17, yes. She's getting ready to turn three years old. So we're gonna meet our next kid here. Give me a moment. What to do? All right. Uh-oh, this one wants to stay and take a nap. All right, let's meet our next bird. Hooray! Yay! Hi, Tyga! So this is our next bird. This is Tyga. Tyga is our resident great gray owl. Great gray owls are often given credit for being among the tallest owls on planet Earth. Even though they don't weigh very much, this monster of a bird weighs in at uh, only about two and a half pounds. It's kind of incredible to imagine. This is an even harder thing to imagine. See her neck? Her, her neck down inside those feathers is about as big around as a quarter. It's not much bigger. Now it can stretch when she eats, things like that. But just resting with her trachea and her esophagus and all her arteries and stuff, it's not much bigger around than a quarter right now. So this bird is all feathers. She is all feathers. Now Tyga came to us um, when she was very young. This is her at eight weeks old at Teton Raptor Center. <laughs> we call this her angry Muppet stage of development. This is her angry Muppet stage of development. This was her at eight weeks old. And when Tyga came to us, she actually uh, was found by our research team. Our research team studies great gray owl nests here in Jackson Hole. She was found by the research team and she had a broken wing. All indications, the scrapes on the tree, the poop on the ground, the sound recorders that we had in the area, all indications are that she was predated, meaning that she was attacked. Now, something cool to know about owls is that owls are famous for leaving their nest before they can fly. They often do this. And during that time, it's the most vulnerable time of their life. That's when not having your dogs on a leash, that's when having your cats loose. If they come across these owls, they're just sitting ducks. Mom and dad are off hunting for them. They'll feed them on the ground, care for them on the ground. Uh, but it's a really dangerous time. And owl, um, Tyga here had three siblings. There were four babies total in the nest. And unfortunately, something attacked them and uh, her right wing was damaged. So the research team found her and they said, oh, well, we're not just a research team, we're also a rehab clinic, we're also a bird hospital. So they brought her in and unfortunately, we took her to the vet the day she came to us, but unfortunately, the damage to her wing was permanent. And so she was never gonna fly. She, she never has flown, she's very fast at running and uh, she certainly finds her way around, but we have to accommodate her in her enclosure um, keeping her perches low so that she won't hurt herself. But that's why Tyga lives with us. And great gray owls are super cool because they're a super cold weather bird. Cold, cold, cold. Jackson Hole is about as far south as you'll find these guys. And then they live way up into Canada. So if you think about their habitat being like the shape of a slice of pizza, Jackson Hole is the part of the pizza you take that first bite, uh, which is pretty amazing how these guys, and again, it goes back. Let me show you those really feathered toes. She's got incredibly fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy toes. And that's all about helping her handle the cold, cold weather. Now people see Tyga, and when they see her, I don't know if we can get her to show you both of her eyeballs there. When, we, when people see Tyga, they often comment, man, owls have insanely big eyes. They really do. And that goes back to the neck movement and it goes back to when they hunt. So owls have incredibly large eyes. I would like to, everybody say bye to Tyga, bye Tyga. We have one more for you, don't worry. Um, owls have these super cool eyeballs. You go in Tyga. There we go. All right, so turns out owls eyeballs, more visuals, Owl's eyes are sort of shaped like a mushroom or a light bulb, and they sit in the socket in such a way, you're looking at the smallest part of their eyes when you look at them. So if you think about an old, a light bulb, 
and these are owl's eyes, this is the part you see when you look at the owl, the part that screws into the socket. So imagine how much of their skull is occupied by their eyeballs. And that is a couple, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because owls like to hunt dusk, dark, sunrise, right? They like to be out when the light is low. And so having these huge eyes allows them to absorb all this light. They don't need street lights. They don't need a flashlight or a headlamp. <laughs> An owl with a headlamp, that's pretty good. <laughs> oh, sorry, I digress. Um, they don't need any of that. Just the light of the stars is enough for them, which is really quite amazing. So just keep that in mind. You at home, uh, if you didn't see our video on Tuesday, you can actually take old toilet paper tubes and you can give yourself owl goggles. Just cut a toilet paper tube in half and then stick them up to your eyes. The reason that mimics an owl is that their eyes are super cool, but what do you notice? They're not round. Their eyes are not round. And because their eyes aren't round, they can't move them around in their sockets. Their eyes are fixed forward. So a lot of people say owls look really intense and that's because their eyes don't move. Their eyes are always facing forward. They have very, very, you know, a degree or two at most of movement in there. And so because of that, owls need to have all that flexibility in the neck, right? Because their eyes, they can absorb a lot of light. They have pretty good focus from a distance, uh, but they're not able to move them. So if they want to look up, they have to turn their whole head up to do it. If they want to see behind them. You can see behind you. You can turn your head and then cut your eyes and you can see behind you. These guys can't do that. Now, before we meet our last bird, I do want to tell you real quick, people tend to have two reactions when they meet an owl, two responses. The first response they have is, oh, oochie boo -chi boo boo chi boo boo chi boo. I hear that a lot, just like that. And that's because um, there are two broad categories of owls. We have owls that we call eared owls, and then we have owls that are called non-eared owls. So Train, that first bird you met, she was an eared owl. She had those tufts on top. And then the non-eared owls tend to have a much rounder, bigger, flatter facial disc to help them listen. But one thing that the non-eared owls are missing is that it's all in the eyebrows. So people react one way to this kid. This is Hemlock, by the way, our resident barred owl. And this is Hemlock hanging out in Grand Teton National Park last summer. Just throwing this out there that uh, when this is all over, uh, the birds are in the park and you could come and get this picture with your phone like I did. So put a visit to visit Grand Teton National Park in Yellowstone on your list. Not now, when this is all over. So non-eared owls have this really cute, this guy's nicknamed the teddy bear owl, right? But the birds that have the ear tufts tend to have really deep brow ridges. Now I want you to imagine if your eyebrows were always down like this, you would look really intense too. And that's the thing. People respond one of two ways when they meet an owl. They say, oh, Gigi boo, or they say, holy moly, that thing is looking into my soul. They get really intimidated. Keep in mind, the eyes don't move, right? So they're fixed and their brow ridges are really low. That helps block glare, right? Helps them see, helps them, helps block that glare. And so these eared owls tend to have this really intense look. These are the ones that get that reputation for being really intense. You'll also notice that the ones that have the ear tufts versus the ones that don't, the ones with ear tufts don't tend to have as big of a facial disc. It tends to be a little bit smaller versus the ones that don't. Amazing. Owls are amazing. Go team, go. Who agrees? Yes, yes, yes. All right. The last owl that we're going to meet, her story starts at the very beginning. Um, it all starts with this guy. Look at that. Now, this is him a few years ago, <laughs> but uh, this is Teton Raptor Center's founder. His name is Roger, and this is Roger with one of our resident birds named Ruby several years ago. Um, but Roger and his wife, Margaret, many, many, many years ago, over 20 years ago, Roger is a biologist, and he was studying red-tailed hawks here in Jackson Hole, checking out their movements, learning about some of the dangers that they were um, threatened by, especially parasites in the nest. So Roger and his wife, Margaret, kept getting all these calls. Oh, somebody found an injured owl. Call Roger, that raptor guy. He'll know what to do. And Roger and Margaret decided that they were going to start rehabilitating birds in their home. They got the permits. It takes permits to do that. But it was small, and they just had a few birds at a time. So they started taking care of injured birds. 
Well, one night they got a call about an injured great horned owl and that great horned owl had been hit by a car right here in Wilson, Wyoming. Wilson's in Jackson Hole. And they found this owl. They reached out, rescued her, got her in, tried several surgeries and the bird was taken forever to heal. So if you think about it in your own house, where is a good place to put a, a bird that's pooping everywhere and slinging food everywhere, slinging rat guts and stuff? Where's a good place in your house to put that thing so that it's easy to clean every day. I know what you're thinking and you're right, the bathtub. So that's what happened. This bird got put in the bathtub and it was really easy to clean every day. The problem with this is that at the time, Roger and Margaret had two small kids and those kids wanted to take their baths, right? So, so the story goes, one night, uh, their little daughter, uh, uh, wanted to take a bath and she marched in to mom and dad very angry and said get that thing out of the tub I want to take a bath and they kind of giggled and laughed and got the bird out of the way and then they realized wait she's right we should get that thing out of the tub we should uh, get that thing out of the way because you know what we've outgrown doing this at home and so it turns out that owl in the tub all these years later is still around so I'd like to introduce you to the matriarch of our program now. And I should also mention that she was named, she was named by Roger's daughter at four years old. So her name is Owly. Put these up, people are watching. Yes, helpful. Show them your tufts. So this is Owly and she's our resident great horned owl. So if you've been doing a little bit of math, you can tell that Owly is the oldest bird at Teton Raptor Center. She is 18 years old this year. And how cool that she started in a tub. She progressed her way. Teton Raptor Center formally became Teton Raptor Center around 2008, 2009. We moved here to the Hardeman Barns in Jackson Hole, Wyoming in 2010. And Owly has been around for all of it. Teton Raptor Center is currently embarked on a huge $10 million project to give these guys new homes. Owly herself, her new building got new footings just yesterday, new cement poured just yesterday. And by Thanksgiving, she's going to have an amazing new home. So how cool for Owly to go from a tub to a $10 million state-of-the-art facility. We're so, so excited. Now, great horned owls are one of the coolest owls in North America because... They're very common. They're the most common owl in North America. They're the heaviest in the lower 48. So her first cousin is a bird called a snowy owl, Hedwig from Harry Potter, if you're familiar. And um, snowy owls do weigh more, but they're not considered really a year-round resident of the lower 48. So she's considered um, uh, the heaviest in the lower 48 states. And great horns are really cool because they're not picky. Uh, one really cool thing about owls is that these guys will... Here's what you need to know about owls, actually. Perch potatoes, okay? These guys are absolutely, totally going to do the least amount possible. Do you know how they hunt? They sit in a tree, yep, yeah, and then the food flies by, and then you know what they do? And they just land on it. They grab the food, back up in the tree, eat it, wait for it again. They're also a little bit on the lazy side when it comes to nesting. Lazy, in, ingenious, I don't know. You can use your own words. Intuitive, smart about it, I don't know. But these guys are actually... They don't build a nest. They just find another nest that's not in use and they use that. So right now, the great horned owls all across the country are trying to scoot in and raise their babies before the hawks want the nest or before the squirrels want to come back. They just use somebody else's nest. That's what they do in the wild. Now, these guys, when you hear or see a great horned owl, we hear a lot of stories over and over again. I don't like that owl. It's going to get my cat. It's going to get my dog. Could it happen? Possibly. If you have a pet that weighs under 12 or 13 pounds, you probably should have it in the house with you. It loves you, bring it inside. But really truly going back to what we already know, this bird cannot catch or transmit rabies. She can't catch or transmit fleet. I know, but exactly. And by the way, they hoot. She gives a hoot too about her story. They don't also can't get distemper. So it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. They not only do they catch these animals, they clean the environment. Now, some of you out there have probably been told, don't ever touch a baby bird because the mama will smell you and she won't come back. Now, is it true that if you disturb a nest when the babies are quite young, that the mama will leave and not come back. Yes, that's very true. It's very important to leave nests alone. 
but it is not true that it's because they smell you, okay? As a matter of fact, everybody know what a great horned owl's most favorite food is? Most, most, most favorite. Here we go. Skunks. These dudes are one of the last known predators in North America for skunks. There is not much that will go after a skunk. And you know why that is? Because skunks stink. They stink. And the cool thing is, great horned owls, almost no sense of smell. So that skunk has almost no defenses against these guys. The downside to that is that if these guys are going after a skunk near a roadway and they get hit by a car and they've been skunked and they stink like a skunk, then they come into our rehabilitation clinic and they're stanky. So... Very cool stuff to know about great horns. We have to thank them for their service. Be really grateful if you hear a great horned owl or see a great horned owl. This is the time of year when they're talking a lot because they have something to say. Uh, they're trying to find their mates. They're trying to get ready. They're courting each other. They're defending their territories. They're getting ready to nest. It's a really important time of year. So that's Owly, the great horned owl. Owl, a really cool bird to get to meet, the matriarch of our program. We can't do a Facebook Live uh, without incorporating Owly. Now, I should mention, um, Owly is much like Tyga. After that car strike, she never flew. She was only about 10 months old when that happened. She's 18 now. So her enclosure is also accommodating to her limitations. So we keep her perching low um, so that she's able to not hurt herself in any way. And which brings me to a couple of things you guys should know. The first thing is that we are gonna post this afternoon I have some ideas. Some of you guys are trying to learn remotely about owls. I hope we've gotten a good start for you today. Um, but I have made a list of different age groups and um, some different activities that we'll post here shortly as soon as we finish of different age groups and some activities you can do. Another really cool uh, math, I know we did the four mice a day times 365 days a year for the barn owl. Other really cool math is exponential math. And that is when you start thinking about um, mice and their reproductive rates. So when one owl catches a mouse, you are literally preventing a million mice from getting into the environment in one year's time. And that has to do with exponential math. So that's a pretty cool one. Mice can have between 12 and 15 babies at a time. And those babies are able to have babies of their own at just six weeks old. So then in six weeks, all 12 of those babies have 12 to 15 babies. And then in six weeks, all those babies have 15 babies. That is a lot of babies and that is a lot of mice. So these guys, we owe them such a service to have them around. The other thing, and I'm I'm going to go ahead uh, uh, and we're getting ready to wind it down here. But the other thing I do want to point out is that there are things that you can do to help owls. Um, I don't know if this is backwards to you. If it is, we'll be sure to post it again. But there are ways that you can help owls out. Um, everybody always wants to know that bird's really cool. What can I do to help it? Um, first thing you can do is find your local rehab center. Figure out today, if I find an injured animal, where's it going to go? Do some research from your own backyard and figure out who are you going to call? How are you going to get them help? And what are you going to do? The next thing is to never, 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 never. What did I say? Never. How many times did I say it? At least three. Never try to take care of injured wildlife at your own house. You have good intentions, but you want to treat it like you would a pet. You want to give it food and water and snuggles. And these guys are not social. They don't want any of that. And food and water can be the last thing that they need. So our good intentions often result in more harm than good. So make sure you know who is the person that can really take care of these guys. The reason that's so worth knowing is that it's actually against the law for you to try to rehabilitate these guys at home. So know your facts, know what's going on. Another thing you can do, I mentioned earlier with the barn owl, put up a nest box. Check it out. Do some Googling. Find out about owls in your area. There are a ton of cavity nesting owls like screech owls and saw wet owls that love to hang out in nest boxes and will nest in there. And that, again, doing you a service if you can get them to hang out near your house. So think about a nest box. That's a project you could work on right now is building one. Next, throw away any poison that you have in your house for rodents. Any poison that you have, throw it away. And the reason for that is that, yeah, the poison might work on some of those mice and rats, but what it does really is it slows them down. Then they crawl out of the barn or the shed, and then the owls eat the poisoned animals. And you know what happens then? Then the owls die. And when you lose your owls, you have a much bigger problem than you started with. Poison is doing you no good. Throw it away, throw it away. It's not necessary. It's not helpful in the environment at all. Other things you can do is you can slow down when you're driving at sunset and sunrise, especially at night. These guys don't know what a car is, and so these guys don't know to avoid them. Oh, 
Some people might be commenting on her panting. Um, it's hot in here. It's like 72 degrees in our building right now, and Audi lives outside. This morning, it was 17 degrees in Jackson Hole. I don't need to know how warm it is where many of you are right now. That's just mean. Oh, and wait, what was it doing, Amanda? Snowing. snowing. It was snowing again today again every day so it's hot in here so when owls and birds get hot they pant just like a dog i'm getting hot myself in here and i don't even have a fur coat a feathered coat on a down coat um so keep that in mind um to slow down when you're driving the last thing to know is that you can pick up litter and to make sure you understand that litter is anything on the sides of the road litter could be uh, an apple core litter could be that piece of sandwich those last few fries that fell on the floorboard of the car when you throw those things outside of your car you draw in prey to the sides of the road the rabbits the chipmunks the squirrels the mice the voles all those animals then want to get some free food so those things come in and then these guys go for a free meal so they're hunting on the sides of the highway they don't know what a car is and they can get hit so it's really important to Pay attention to that, to think about that. If you have an opportunity to pick up trash, even if it's not yours, it's okay. Pick it up, help out. Imagine that at some point in your life, you probably had some litter get away from you that you didn't realize. So please be mindful, pick up litter. Be That's something you can get out and do. Uh, when you're social distancing, you can still be six feet apart and pick up trash. As the snow is melting and the spring is coming on, that's a really good thing you can do to help out wildlife. So there you go. We've met four owls this morning. <laughs> exactly. We've met four owls this morning, an Eastern screech owl, a barn owl, a great gray owl, and a great horned owl. I wanna thank you guys for your time. Um, many of you had questions as we go. Oh, someone wants to see her legs. I did see that happen. Here you go. She's got great feet. So any of the questions that we weren't able to answer during this live broadcast, I do wanna throw out there that we will go through them. Thank you for your comments and your kind words today. We will go through those today and uh, we'll be sure to answer them for you. So please tune back in, check the comment stream later and we'll get those answered for you. If you enjoyed today and you wanna geek out with your beak out some more, you wanna meet some more birds from Teton Raptor Center, let us know that too and we'll plan to tune in again soon and bring you some more birds. We wish you all a wonderful afternoon and have a great day.